Welcome back to another episode of the MODIS movement. Today we are going to be talking about dietary sensitivities and intolerances around whey and casein proteins and just dairy in general. And uh, this topic hits home for me because I am lactose intolerant. And this is something I wasn't aware of until I started working with MODIS and learning all about the signs of the food intolerance from Dr. Pastori. And I'm really excited that we can share that same knowledge that I learned with you guys today. Uh, and this might be a little bit of too much information for people, but I just want to be completely honest and open about my experiences with lactose intolerance uh, in case anyone else is going through this as well. So I have always been lactose intolerant, but I didn't know it. And growing up, I was a really gassy kid. Like little eight-year-old Lexi, I could out, out burp my uncles. Um, it was something I was proud of, but you know, gas coming out the other end, I could also clear a room, which was really, really embarrassing growing up, you know, school, sports practice, sleepovers. And I just always thought, you know, this is how I am. I can't change it. Uh, all my meals growing up had milk or they were cooked in butter. My parents weren't educated in nutrition. But since I've made that transition to go completely dairy free, my skin is cleared up. I'm less sore after my workouts and uh, I'm recovering better and I have no gas at all. So it's completely changed my life. And it is all due to this man right here, Dr. Robert Pastore. Oh my goodness. Well, Lexi, thank you for, for that intro. Uh, and I, I, greatest, one of the greatest things that ever happened is you came into my life. So <laughs> honor and a pleasure every day to work with you. Thank you. So we are going to get into the science of food intolerances versus allergies versus autoimmune conditions in future episodes. Uh, but today we are solely focusing on dairy. And this is a true fact. So it was really surprising when I first heard it. But according to the National Institute of Health, uh, they report that 65% of the adult population has a reduced ability to digest lactose. So Dr. Pastore, what does that mean? Well, it, and this is, this is the number one definition of a food intolerance. And I think the audience, listening audience, should really understand that this is a well-known clinical terminology by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, which has a ridiculous acronym of AAAAAI. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so with, what, they, what they have uh, said is that when you have the inability to produce an enzyme for a, to break down a specific food that you're ingesting, that is a clinical uh, deficiency of that enzyme, and then therefore that is an intolerance to that substance in that food. So when a human being has lactose intolerance, they do not produce the digestive enzyme lactase to properly digest that milk sugar. Lactose is predominantly found in um, concentrated dairy products. Yes, there's much found in whey protein isolates, casein protein isolates, but we're really going to feel it if we have like a condensed milk or a low fat milk that's removing the fat and you're going to notice more of the lactose and the protein being present uh, after that fact. So you'll notice people consuming that that have a lactose intolerance, definitely feeling some of the ramifications that you were mentioning. I also want to add that this is a growing trend of identification. A lot of people are finally waking up to saying, maybe it's not a good thing to just mask this. If I have this intolerance genetically, what does that really mean? Do I, is it okay that I'm just drinking milk that is void of this or contains the enzyme? You know, there's lactate milk in the States so that you can then consume this milk and not have any problems. I'd like to be so bold, Lexi, to, to say this. If you are having straight gastrointestinal reactions after consuming a lactose-containing food and then saying, I have belching, I have gastrointestinal discomfort, potentially some flatulence after consuming this, I then would go, okay, that fits this 4A1I, <laughs> the American Academy of Asthma and Allergy uh, and Immunology's definition of an intolerance. They believe it's predominantly gastrointestinal based with its symptomatology, exactly what you described. But then when you said, I recover better, my skin got better, all these other types of experiences outside of my gastrointestinal tract got better, that is more under the definition of an immunological reaction you could be having to that food. And that's something I'm extremely interested in. And that's what I do not believe enough people that have this lactose intolerance, either diagnosed by a medical doctor or a dietitian first doing the probing, or even on their own, are not looking enough into. 
So it's, it's, yes, you will be rescued from the embarrassment of flatulence, perhaps, by consuming milk that is lactose-free or by taking the enzyme that you're naturally deficient in. But I think you would actually be cutting yourself short and probably would still experience some of these other symptoms. The skin abnormalities you're experiencing, definitely the inflammatory reactions you are having. And, and that to me is, is where we bridge the gap between uh, food intolerance by definition and in food intolerance that actually has more nomenclature around it. Like you could be experiencing a non-IgE mediated delayed food allergy reaction. These are true real things that exist in food immunology, but not enough attention is being put on it because there will never be a wonder drug that makes that go away. The solution is stopping it right? It's, it's stopping the food. I have now, for the people that take lactase pills with yeah. their milk product, how effective is that? Uh, not, not 100%. Uh, we've known that. It just re- it's kind of like um, when we talked about organics versus non-organics, you're not getting zero pesticides, you're getting way, way, way less. The same thing transpires when you're taking these, these supplements. You'll notice these supplements, meaning uh, lactose, uh, digesting enzyme lactase, along with your dairy product, you will just reduce the gastrointestinal complaints that you have. You're not doing anything about inflammation if you're experiencing inflammation associated with that. You're not going to do anything about skin abnormalities if you experience skin abnormalities with that. You're just reducing your gastrointestinal discomfort. I'd like to say you're masking. You're masking the real governing problem. Clearly, the individual has a problem with that ingredient in dairy uh, and, and should not consume that. Now, I'm on the camp where I have a classic dairy allergy. I haven't consumed dairy in, God, I think it's 29 years now. And I'm like, not that I'm keeping count. Um, and not, not knowingly. I've been punked. And trust me, I've paid my, my ramification to dairy is a migraine headache that will last anywhere from four to seven days that has no known treatment. Um, I didn't go as far as heroin, (laughs) but any of the known classic like migraine blockers, injectables, I've done it all. I had migraines for 20 years of my life. It was all caused by dairy. That was my my allergy slash intolerance experience. And doctors denied me of, of uh, uh, the belief system that it was an allergy because I did not have at the time the classic measurement of an allergy, like a skin wheel scratch test at the time. I ended up having true IgE antibodies in my blood and then a more uh, classic delayed antibody response in my blood. There's different types of antibody reactions we can have to foods. We can delve into that more deeper on a different uh, show. Uh, but I just want the audience to know now if I would have taken lactose pills with that, that's not going to do anything for my migraine. Now, when you are consuming something that you're intolerant to, such as like milk or a whey protein, how is that affecting your digestive tract? Oh, wow. Well, if you're, if you're having gastrointestinal reactions, there is without a doubt in a call to arms of the immune system. There's immunological reactions. There's pro-inflammatory chemicals that are in there. There may be uh, something known as the separation of intestinal tight junction cells. If you think of a deck of playing cards and we lay those cards out and we have them very tight together out on a table as if a magician was getting prepared for a magic trick, you could see they're extremely tight together, how thin those playing cards are. They're sturdy, yet you could see there's no seam between them. If you were to imagine that's how our intestinal cells are lined up. And the reason that's so important is they're allowing in uh, protection so that we can digest our food and have specific complete food nutrients processed through the liver, absorbed and disseminated throughout the body. Some may pass through areas in the small intestine that are, have the, the pockets of our finger-like projectiles known as the lacteals. That's within the villi and microvilli so that we can absorb nutrients more effectively. It just makes us an efficient machine. If things go awry and those cells separate, we can have food particles in a location where they don't belong, inflammatory chemicals in a location where they don't belong, which starts signaling an immunological response. So several things can happen. You can have problems outside of the area where your food is sitting. So for example, joint pain, various types of body discomfort and immunological reactions, skin reactions, hives, all transpire when we have that breaching of the gut membrane. Then the big thing we have to keep in mind is if you're having direct gastrointestinal symptoms, and let's say you actually have a loose bowel movement, whoa, you just expedited transit time that you normally would require for digesting the food you had. Therefore, you're one, not digesting fully and appropriately. 
Two, not extracting all the key nutrients required from said foods. And three, could end up having borderline deficiency states, suboptimal intakes, and definitely not getting what you think you're getting from your meal. And that's, that's a very strong messaging. So if I have a woman that is at risk for osteoporosis or may have the precursor osteopenia or just that family history, and she thinks loading up on dairy products, which are a good source of calcium on a label, but she's having food intolerances and loose stools after consuming it, she's not getting that calcium. She's not getting that vitamin D. She's actually doing her body a disservice. Now, for the people that experience minor, minor, minor symptoms where like I feel a grumbling in my stomach after I have a whey protein shake or something like that. How detrimental is it to be consuming that even though they're not experiencing major symptoms? Well, I I could tell you if I connect that to my work in professional athletes, that was a major red flag. You know, you really shouldn't feel, I had a giant protein shake before our morning meeting and here I am talking to you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And you know, 30 grams of protein, a huge bolus. And I'll be honest, I drank it quite briskly because I'm chasing a 15 month old around at the same time, trying to make sure she's fed before I start my work day. Um, I, I don't even feel anything in my stomach. You know, digestion is an autonomic nervous system response mechanism. I don't close my eyes and cross my fingers and go, I'm going to digest now. It should happen. It should be passive. There's things, of course, that are normal, overeating, eating the wrong foods, if you feel bloated or distended. But if you even feel like a little bit of something going on in your gut, I would absolutely say record that in a food journal the way you would an exercise journal, a positivity journal, whatever you do. I'm a big fan of journaling. Record that. Do the opposite for a period of time, repeat the journaling negative events, and see if you can repeat, as long as you're hopefully not harming yourself with an anaphylactic reaction, but if you could repeat that problem, consider that a potential food intolerance, because that is one of the biggest things that came out of a huge summit on trying to prove how to ascertain the difference between a true food allergy and a food intolerance And one of the biggest concluding remarks by all the world's experts of all the different divisions of Academy of Allergy, et cetera, is repetition. If you eat mustard and this happens and you eat mustard again and that happens, it's it's a cause and effect direct connection. Having said that, wrench about to go in the machinery. There's something very well known in my work that I identified over 20 years of experience, which is a hidden food mediated reaction where people do not immediately identify the cause and effect please understand obviously we're all different people some people can feel temperatures different than other people almost immediately we have different taste sensations we have different responses to our environment responses to stress if someone's extremely stressed and they drink or consume the healthiest thing for them they may have a momentary negative reaction in their gut because they're actually getting into a fight or flight response, moving blood flow away from the digestive organs to their muscles to fear, flee or fight. So if you have all of that eliminated from your life and you're hearing or feeling something, listen to your body and remove it. If you can identify, that's when I really think seeking out a professional. If you're saying these nagging aches and pains, I have this nagging skin problem that I really believe in my heart is associated with food, but I can't figure it out. A specialist in nutrition can help you. A certified nutrition specialist, a registered dietitian knowledgeable in food allergies could potentially be your first line of defense to help you identify what this problem is. What could they do? They could do something as simple as a wonderful tool we use in nutrition that doesn't, it's not even expensive. It's a food frequency questionnaire. It's so interesting to see how often people eat stuff. And I would recommend people finding a really good qualified version of it, maybe one endorsed by a certified nutritional body, and then practicing that on their own. And they may say, huh, you know, I didn't realize that I eat more strawberries than anything else at the end of a 30-day period of time. Maybe I should switch to some other fruit for a period of time and see if that's it. So I always look for if someone's trying to find a hidden or delayed food mediated reaction in the absence of doing any type of testing on them or in concert, you never should run away from or, or blow off the importance of journaling and food frequency. How often are you consuming what in your diet? Because sometimes what you're consuming on a daily basis or as frequently as that, could be the problematic food. 
And like, if you go back for me personally, two years ago now, I was eating yogurt. I had six different flavors of whey protein because, you know, <laughs> who doesn't want bubblegum protein powder? <laughs> exactly. It was delicious. Um, I was having milk in my cereal and it was all things that added up that I didn't put together. Now, with your experience with professional athletes, how often did you see them come in with an unknown dairy intolerance? I, I'm going to really just, I, I, 90% of the time, I kid you not. And, and there's some reasons behind that. There's reasons behind that. One, you could say, well, Dr. Pastore, you had a tainted pool of subjects because people obviously were seeking you out if they thought there potentially could be something going on nutritionally with a nutrient or a food. Correct. So I definitely had that. But number two, just being a high intensity training athlete actually increases your risk for a food mediated reaction. And this is very well known. It's proved scientifically, but people just don't want to talk about it. It doesn't get enough media uh, attention. When you exercise to a very high level of intensity, you actually secrete specific types of proteins, enzymes that are phosphorylated, and they can separate the intestinal tight junction cells. Just as I was saying, that can happen um, with, with something that you're consuming that is potentially deleterious to you. One person's food could truly be another person's problem. So if an athlete is just by default, by their occupation, has that problem happening, and they're, let's say, in the dugout, just nonstop eating sunflower seeds and continuing that at home, they probably have a higher risk of potentially having an immunological reaction to those seeds. And I would need to remove, identify that, remove that, rotate that in their diet, solve the problem after a period of elimination, switch them to a pumpkin seed, something that I know is historically more innocuous from an allergenicity scale, because uh, there's classic allergies, as we know, right? Peanuts are way more allergenic than any other uh, legume or pulse in the family that they're in. Um, but we, you know, it, one person's food, though, I don't want to just say we should just look at the main allergens, but one person's food could truly be another person's problem. A lot of times athletes would come in and not have a clue. And then on, on the paper, the data, and then there, that classic journaling. We're in the off season, let's stop doing this. Let's now reintroduce it. And they, to quote one of my ball players, he felt like he was hit with a ton of bricks. Kind of like how you were like, oh my God, this one gentleman, and it ended up being in, in the, the popular press, he said, the, doctor, the doctors who want to rehab him would say, where's the pain? And he would say, everywhere. You know how hard that is if you're the physical therapist for a player of a professional team who's making tens of millions of dollars, and your job is, oh my God, I got to get them well, rehab, get them back out on the field, and he can't tell you where it hurts? And then I was able to get him healthy, had the best career, a year of his career he ever had. And that's on public record. But then more importantly, all athletes will feel pain. All athletes are going to ache. He was then able to say it hurts exactly here. And then they would be able to address exactly where his pain was. So it's, it, it, it's always eye-opening to them when they find out exactly what's, what's wrong. Um, and the last thing I just want to mention on that is, please, anyone who's listening or hasn't listened to it, please listen to the Raul Abanez podcast with my conversation with a good friend who, who was also a patient of mine in the past. And his story is remarkable at how two food reactions he was having prevented him at 37 years old from being able to run uh, 40 yards uh, without pain. And then in a short period of time, he was able to do 100 yards without any pain. And if you're a, a fan of baseball like I am, the rest of his career is history, literally. <laughs> For sure. Now, let's jump into whey protein powder. Yes. Uh, because this is a huge topic just around modus in general. Um, and kind of aside from the modus movement podcast, we also have the concept of the modus movement, which is a shift away from whey based protein powders and dairy based protein powders to something that you do not react to. So why for all of these years has whey been deemed the king of protein powder? It, it, great question, Lexi. It's been deemed the king of protein powder because it's difficult to argue with what it looks like on paper. It is, first of all, I think the listeners may know by now that whey is basically a waste byproduct of the cheese industry and the dairy industry, separating the curds from whey. Uh, and we know that the whey is this liquid portion that is extremely rich in all the essential amino acids, particularly the branch chain amino acid leucine, um, a lot of conditionally essential amino acids and secondary non-essential amino acids. So when you look at that on paper and that looks fantastic, that's alluring. There's also been tons of published and sponsored research on short-term consumption 
of way, increasing one's musculature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when I was, um, and I don't want to say a debate, but it ends up sadly turning into that. When you have real research purists with PhDs such as myself that then are blind by that dogma, don't fit in the category we have. By the way, we're in the majority. So they're in the minority of being able to make their own lactose, bless their little hearts. <laughs> and they're jumping up and down with a flag in the sand of how great this protein is and look at the changes in musculature. And one of my arguments I've said, and this actually just happened recently was, I will never be able to feel the benefits that you're seeing in that clinical journal because the food makes me so physically ill. And yes, I gave my migraine story, but I also could give you 13 years of loose stool stories if you don't mind me sharing that too much information just by consuming any dairy product. So zero benefit comes my way when I'm consuming whey. Ironically, individuals who can consume whey will have zero problem with a plant-based protein that actually looks as good, if not better than whey on paper, and they will not have any of the gastrointestinal distress. So it's interesting how this working with proteins that are in the plant-based realm can be more partisan. And it's not just a one side, other side, left, right. Both people can consume the plant-based side, but the plant-based side people can never, who are really reactive like you, and in my more severe case, we can never even experiment onto the whey-based side. So I think it really comes from the, the reason it became the rock star uh, is this dogma. And it's going on and on and on, but the tides are turning. What helped a lot was the work of a brilliant man that I've been um, a huge fan of since I read his first paper in 1999 called Serial Grains, Humanity's Double-Edged Sword. I'm referring to the great Dr. Lauren Cordain, a retired professor emeritus at uh, Colorado State. Um, he, he really put on the map the research of an evolutionary uh, human diet through clinical study, where Lauren's job wasn't seeing patients. Lauren's job was actually putting together academic research, putting it through the peer-reviewed process and publishing it, and making studies on human beings. And he wrote a lot of papers on how dairy is this, on, on, sadly, this wonder kid that came about, and there was a lot of politics that were involved behind it, and that we really don't need it to survive. And uh, we need protein to survive but we don't need dairy protein to survive. So I think the tides are turning. It is a slow moving wheel, but, but it's moving. Now for the people that buy lactose free whey protein powder, so whether it's a whey isolate or whatever it is, does that still have dairy? Is that still going to cause a reaction? Yeah, it, it, for, and, and free is kind of like the definition of caffeine free. If you go and you get a decaf coffee, do you, are you aware you're still getting about five milligrams of caffeine? Um, I wouldn't drink that before bed, by the way. If you do that after dinner, stop now if you have a sleep problem. Uh, so it, it's not zero caffeine. It, it goes back to, I love those enlightening pearls, you know, Lexi, about just telling people the truth about things. Uh, same thing with, this is sodium free. It has sodium in it. It just has below the benchmark of what the government says is when you have to report it on the label, right? So those things exist. This is trans fat free, but it has hydrogenated oil in the ingredient line. If you're below half a gram, you're allowed, per serving, you're allowed to say you're trans fat free. But what happens if you eat the box? You increase your risk by heart attack by in the 30 something percentage, whatever that last study was. So no, you, when you consume a, a lactose free whey and you're lactose intolerant, I promise you, you're still exposed to sub lactose. You will reduce your symptom levels. It absolutely still is dairy. No, how to, no matter how much you change the duck, it's a duck. So there's nothing you can do to whey to make it not whey, except not have whey. <laughs> that wouldn't make sense. You'd be selling air. Uh, so whey is still dairy. It's a highly concentrated form of dairy. And the people that have negative reactions to dairy, those that like you are reporting an inflammatory process, that is way beyond lactose. And you should stay away from whey. And that's one of the things up here in Canada. I don't know if it's a thing in the States, but we have lactose free yogurt. And I am a huge lover of Greek yogurt. And it was something that I was consuming up until about a year ago. So I had eliminated all of my dairy products, but I was like, oh, I can still have lactose-free Greek yogurt. And when I eliminated that entirely, my skin got even better. Mm -hmm. So it was, I wasn't experiencing any sort of digestive issues as much or anything that was noticeable, mm -hmm. but I was still reacting to it. I just wasn't aware. You just weren't aware. And there, there's a couple of factors there. There's definitely the immunological reaction. And then Dr. Cordain published some really interesting research that he had published in the Journal of Dermatology 
um, on how whey and particularly fat-free dairy products could lead to an increase in acne, acne genesis. And one of the mechanisms of action was the fact that these proteins from dairy can still have some hormones in them, even when they're hormone free on the label or this cow was, you know, never experienced a hormone injection or fed anything with a hormone. They're still producing hormones as the natural byproduct of how they would make their own calves grow. So there's still beta cellulin. That's a growth factor that um, we know humans have a specific receptor for that in the gastrointestinal tract that could make that stimulate epithelial growth factor. We know that uh, dairy products and whey products can potentiate insulin growth factor one. They may actually even contain the substance and that is directly linked to the stimulation of acne production. Uh, so there's, there's definitely that growing theme there, but I also want to dial back to the facts that we're talking about today. If you have some type of immunological reaction to a food protein, like in your case, dairy, uh, it, it absolutely can negatively impact your skin uh, just from that perspective itself, just from that immunological reaction. And that was one of the first things I looked for if an athlete came in or, or the general population came into my office there saying, I have these terrible, horrendous skin problems. What can I do to treat them? The first place I looked was what is your immunological reaction to how you're nourishing yourself? That's a very important first question that I think a lot of practitioners miss to this day. Now, how long do you think it would take when someone tries to eliminate dairy? How long would they take to see the benefit? The benefit, you know, Lexi, that, that's another great question. For me with my migraines, I needed to be away from the, the, the food for a, a solid 30 days. And I really believe in a month long process, uh, 21 days minimum, but if you can really get into a full month, I think you'd see a world of benefits because you want to see what your body's like. You'll stop this immunological cascade. You know, what, what we need to think about too is how we brush off original negative reactions followed by how the body adapts. And I think one of the best things I ever discovered just through normal eureka moments of practicing, studying the literature academically, but then practicing is the masking phenomenon that transpires when we put something that's harmful in our bodies. Think of smoking. Whenever I've ever heard of an individual smoke their first cigarette, and there's even been documentaries on this, they will cough up a lung. They're coughing, they're so sick. By the time they finish their first pack, they're no longer coughing. The human body wants homeostasis. It's going to do everything it can, secrete chemicals, various type of opioid-based chemicals to naturally react within its body naturally prevent and counteract that horrible coughing mechanism. Knowing the body's still going to be exposed to this, we need to survive as human beings. And what you will notice over time is that masking phenomenon continues until there's a disease and the individual's burden of toxin is so much more greater than the individual can tolerate. The cup runneth over, we break the masking phenomenon, and we get sick. And I've seen that with dairy. When I was a very little boy, I got deathly sick from consuming milk in kindergarten, I would lie to my parents, I don't want to drink it, make up any excuse to get out of doing it, kept getting in trouble and was forced to consume it. Over time, there was a very short period of time in my life where I had a, I just dealt with it. And then it just spilled over very early before I even finished that first year of, of preschool, uh, kindergarten rather, with a migraine complex that doctors couldn't treat. So it was, I, I had a shorter masking time, thank goodness, than going a lifetime and getting and getting sick, which is what happened with my celiac disease, unfortunately. And that's something that I experienced as well. So like growing up eating dairy all the time, sure I was gassy, but I was able to function. And then once I cut it out, if I reintroduced it occasionally, if I had a chocolate chip cookie or a cinnamon bun or whatever, something that had milk in it, mm -hmm. I felt the effects 10 times worse than they times. ever were when I was consuming it every single day. And it really opens your eyes to like, this is what's going on inside my body. And for me, as someone that lifts five times a week, I would much rather put that energy towards repairing the muscle damage that I'm doing than trying to fix the insides that I've damaged by having a chocolate chip cookie. Absolutely. And, and I, I dislike greatly some of the professional groups that make it seem like you can't live a life without dairy products. And that dogma still exists. There's commercials about, well, then you have to have lactate. Or if you're not getting your three servings or whatever servings for you specifically, you're going to fall to dust. And that is so not true. I had a phenomenal DEXA scan. I'm 49 years old. 
there's, I haven't had dairy in 29 years. I've seen the same exact thing in female athletes. How about that? Long distance runners, triathletes that I have treated, that I have found really react immunologically to dairy, should never consume it and have better bones than they did when they actually were suffering through the female athlete triad while hyper consuming dairy products five to six times a day. They're getting an abundance of calcium, protein, all the nutrients. I'm not denying the food does not have nutritional content. What I'm saying is, if it's making people sick, why should they be forced to consume it? And I say that about every food. Today, we're talking specifically about dairy. I have celiac disease. I can't even think of consuming any of the gluten-containing grains or gluten substances, even though we know they contain nutrients. We, uh, the company Modus has published articles that say wheat is the source of this nutrient. That's great for the general population. I will never be able to procure that nutrient from that food source. We have so many options to get our foods and our, to, with food to get our nutrients. We don't need to just demand one food stay on our diet if it's making us sick. So we bashed dairy in way, but let's say you're part of the 45% that is okay with dairy. What are the benefits? Well, I, that, that's an interesting question because I, <laughs> I did say that I was a big fan of Dr. Lauren Cordain and his research, and I have published uh, some clinical papers on more of a hunter-gatherer type dairy-free diet on specific biological markers. So if we ignore my own personal view, though I have retired from practice, um, th there, there is nutritional content that has been added to dairy products. Dairy is fortified with vitamin D, much to many people's um, uh, lack of knowledge. There's not vitamin D magically appearing in cow's milk. It is fortified with that. Uh, the same holds true for vitamin A to optimize that. And dairy is a decent source of calcium coming in at around 30% for standard serving for um, a milk product. It contains all of the essential amino acids that one would need to support growth if they're in that 45%, but that's just lactose intolerance. We didn't factor in uh, if they have a food allergy or a food intolerance, right? That, that could take us to a higher level. Some doctors, there's a doctor named Theron Randolph, who was a great allergist, and he used to say that 60% of the population probably had a food intolerance or delayed food allergy that they weren't aware of. So if you can imagine that combination, uh, you would see why a lot of people are running away from dairy. Um, having said all of that, I also think there's some problems within the industry. I think if we really start looking at the industry, you would have to go far and wide to find dairy products that are um, really, truly organic. And then please don't believe dairy is 100% hormone-free. That is not possible. There is indeed beta cellulin in every single dairy product that's grass-fed and you know a religious deity was combing and petting the cow as it was feeding on the pasture and being Please, please pardon my sense of humor, but uh, just, no matter what light you want to put on it that's positive, you have to accept that there are risk factors for, for hormones within that. As I expect the risk factors that my kale salad will indeed have some lead in it, like it or not, that's just the law of living in an industrialized society. It just doesn't happen to have levels that are high enough to elicit uh, a negative reaction as set by governing boards that are logical and make sense. I hope I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. Now, how do the 65% that are lactose intolerant go from being okay with their mother's milk mm. to not being able to digest lactose later in life? Yeah, it's a completely different species. We really need to, that's another thing we need to know. I mean, if you really look at cow's milk, and trust me, I spent a lot of time really dissecting it looking at the different proteins, understanding that the casein group is in the 400 plus proteins. It's not just one magical protein called casein. There's so many amino acid and polypeptide chains that make up these things. And the same holds true for how milk is designed. Mother's milk, different calorie perspective, different amino acid perspective, different lactose content, completely different makeup requiring different enzymes compared to uh, the milk that a cow needs to get a baby calf to get to hundreds of pounds. That's, that, there's some serious mechanisms of action to drive that force. And that really only happened in the human diet 10,000, 12,000 years ago, look, depending on which literature you look at. So that's a very new practice on the, of a blip on the human genome scale of us as a species evolving and consuming foods. We really were predominantly hunter gatherers. It's kind of like the last 10 yards of a football field. So if you're looking at an entire football field and you're finally past the 10 yard line, 
that's when milk entered the human genome, if you were to go back all that distance. And it's one of the things I looked at when I was studying 216 hunter-gatherer societies and ended publishing some, some research on what a diet could look like to reduce some of the known risks of cardiovascular disease that big groups look at, right? Like the American Heart Association. I found it fascinating how I improved biological markers by doing nothing but swapping out different types of foods to fill in macronutrients. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a completely different makeup biologically and we can't ignore what would happen to an infant if they were to consume large quantities of beta cellulin right i i hate to say it but in pediatrics we could always tell a formula fed baby from a breastfed baby you could just tell the size of the child how the child is different um my daughter's 15 months old and she's never consumed milk and she's going to consume milk when she consciously goes and purchases her own milk that's when my daughter's going to have access to <laughs> when she's a punk teenager with her allowance and, and, and going to purchase it. And then I'll be there when she's very sick after consuming it for the first time. If, if that doesn't say a lot about my belief system uh, and, and dairy, I, I don't know what else does. I don't think there's any other sound bite I can give you. Lex. <laughs> now for someone that suspects that they might have a dairy intolerance, but they're not sure, what are some of the signs besides gas and bloating that they would look for? Yeah, and, and that's what, so if it's an intolerance and it's beyond lactose, and that's something I want the audience to understand that if it's just lactose intolerance, primarily your symptoms will be gastrointestinal. If it's beyond that, and this may shock you, uh, but I would, I'm hoping the audience will really please hear me out here. Um, believe it or not, if there's something you're experiencing that's chronic, absolutely look to see if there's a food mediated reaction. And what we know from pediatric literature is infant anemia has been linked to dairy allergy. That's huge. I've met adult athletes, predominantly female, that have come in to see me with hair loss, thinking they need to optimize their amino acids. And I find their ferritin, an iron transfer, uh, transfer carrying protein throughout the body, being extremely low, having low serum iron, which is an immediate red flag that they're iron deficient, but also noticing they're on a high quality prenatal a pill that has plenty of iron in it to meet their re recommended daily allowances. So clearly the theory of something disrupting absorption is real. We know it from pediatrics to adults. So if there's chronic anemia, if there's a chronic problem that you're having for a long period of time that doctors can't solve, look in your diet and see if there's something I'm consuming that's actually exacerbating this. Like, pardon me bringing it up, Lexi, since you brought it up, but if there's a chronic skin problem and someone as incredibly healthy as you that takes such great care of themselves, could there be a food they're consuming that's behind that? We can't deny that. There is absolutely a link. It's published in the journals of dermatology that there's a link between food and acne. That's a known fact. So no more is that myth existing that doesn't exist. That's a lie. It does exist and it's published. If there's reduced nutritional absorption, if your doctor says, gee, you know, you're in your 30s or 40s and why are you low in B12? Let's examine your diet. Did you go vegan overnight? No, you could have a food mediated reaction. I've seen that a lot in practice. Men and women in their 20s and 30s having low B12, that's clearly having their, their gastrointestinal tract, their normal digestion. And for the listeners that don't know what B12 does, what are kind of some signs of low B12? being extremely exhausted, being sluggish, being tired, having, wow, my brain is not firing as quickly as it can. That's a clear sign of a B12 uh, deficiency or sub levels of B12. That doctor is all, I've never met a doctor that missed that because it's so well published. You wonder how big of a deal it is, Lexi? There's actually literature on B12 deficiencies mimicking early Alzheimer's symptoms. How frightening is that? Hmm. And I've seen cases and read about doctors and published papers on it and peer reviewed literature of doctors saying, oh my goodness, measure the elderly for B12. If you see someone in the sub 200s and they're eliciting uh, symptoms of, of dementia, it could actually be B12 deficiency. Fix that first. So I've, I've always been fascinated with how nutrients can affect such massive perspectives. Uh, uh, situations of the human body, various different types of symptoms can be drawn about if you're deficient in a key nutrient. Decreased performance. If you're a weekend warrior, if you're someone who just goes to aerobic classes regularly, if you weight train like Lexi regularly, and you're saying, geez, you know, I just, I'm just really not performing the way I want to. That's another sign of a food intolerance. Why? 
How? How does that even make sense? Allow me to explain. The bulk of the human immune system is in the gastrointestinal tract. If that is completely hyper, and I mean by bulk, I mean well over 65%. If that is completely preoccupied with something you're eating and your immune system's reacting and firing and producing these immunological reactions, isn't that like just living with the flu? Of course, you're going to have decreased performance in what you do. And, and if we go back please. a couple podcasts where I had that butternut squash soup, which had the milk or the cream or whatever sort of dairy liquid they put in it to make it taste delicious. <laughs> that following week, I crushed a really hard leg day, but I was sore for five days after. Normally, I recover. My delayed onset muscle soreness is gone within two days max. I was sore for five days. It was ridiculous. And you just, you just hit the next point I wanted to bring up, which is reduced healing time and aches and pains. Those are very real summaries of the symptomatology one would experience if they had a food intolerance outside of something as simple as lactose intolerance. And we need to look at those things. And that's when I really think it makes so much sense. Pardon me that I'm redundant, but I, I loved this exercise as an undergrad student. I, I'm still not bored of it now, approaching 50. A food frequency chart is amazing. First, you get to see, darn, I'm not getting enough asparagus this month. And the second, thing you see, the second thing you see is, wow, I'm having way too much of X or this or that. It's just awesome. And it's broken down into categories. And you really start to see, I need to diversify my diet. If that's just too much work, it's actually one sheet. But if that's too much work, or maybe you want to be more in depth, download a really quick you know, three, five day uh, food journal where you just write down everything you're consuming and it makes it as idiot proof as possible. And you could put in your beverages. Hey, you might come out of that going, wow, I'm dehydrated this week. Well, Dr. Pastore and Lexi, I didn't have any reactions, but thank you for helping me drink more water. Then we did our service. Just know what you're putting in your body. Know how often you're putting it in your body. Come on, man. You're looking at a fuel tank on your car, right? Just really examining how you're nourishing yourself. I think it's critical. And that's one thing that all you have to do is eliminate the food for a period of time. So yes, if you can afford it, if you have the resources, you can go see a nutritionist or a registered dietitian and they can run all of these tests for you. But if you can't, all you have to do is stop eating a food, stop spending money on a dairy product that you would be eating, mm -hmm. switch it to something else, read all of your labels, make sure that there's no may contain milk, there's no modified milk ingredients in there, be diligent for three to four weeks and then try reintroducing it after. And it makes the world of a difference if you are intolerant to a food. World of a difference. And if you could get through that first solid month, we did no harm. There are people that fast and stop all food for a period of time, right? In cultures for religious region reasons, the great holy holiday of Ramadan. Why can't you just say, I'm nourishing my body and I'm gonna stop food X for 30 days. And then I'm, we're begging you to eat it again. See how you feel you may open up this can of a eureka moment that is mesmerizing. Do you know how great it feels to, to have 20 years of migraines, to, actually 17 to be exact, to have 17 years of migraines and then haven't had one uh, unless I was punked in those few, few periods of time and how lousy the drugs made me feel when I was on them because I was so desperate. I mean, I, I don't even understand how I had any academic history because I took my SATs with one eye covered laying on the desk uh, because I had such a blinding migraine that test day, of course, because I was crushing dairy. That was what the dogma, the media, the, the, the education, right? If I'm not getting my three servings of dairy a day, I'm obviously starving myself and I want to be a healthy kid. So, go oh goodness, no, I don't want to starve myself. So, it's all this misunderstanding and, and politi politic political interference that resulted in this, this wave of this 65%. Um, that that's hopefully going to figure this out. So please try try what we're telling you to do today. It can only give, bring you a, a world of good. And if you do want some help, if you're listening to this in either December or January of 2018, 2019, uh, if you go to the Modus Nutrition Instagram, the link in our bio is to sign up for the Modus Movement, which is this shift away from dairy. Uh, we walk you through it. Every single email comes from Dr. Pastori teaching you about all the things that he's learned over his years in practice, different athletes, different stories of people that we've worked with where switching from dairy has changed their life. 
So if you're interested in signing up, head over to our Instagram. Uh, if for some reason you're listening to this a little bit later, send us an email, help, H-E-L-P, at modusnutrition.com. We can send, send the link to you via email. Um, and as always, if you do have questions about whey protein, dairy, intolerances, whatever it may be, feel free to send us an email and I will send all of that over to Dr. Pastori so he can answer it personally. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Modus Movement. And as always, we'll see you next week.